In November 1984, the Consumers Association of Penang, Malaysia organized an international conference with the theme Third World Development or Crises. Over 100 participants from 21 countries attended the conference. At the concluding session, the Third World Network was formed. Since then, the Third World Network has become a grouping of organizations and individuals involved in issues relating to development, developing countries, and North-South affairs. Ten years later, in 1994, the Third World Network Africa, an independent associate of Third World Network, was also formed. Out of that initiative also came a number of regional initiatives where people created independent vehicles like Third World Network Africa in Accra, like the Third World Institute in Montevideo in Uruguay, all of which are committed to carrying forward the broad conclusions of that meeting. But each one of them raises its funds separately and programs separately, but within a broad common vision of the changes that we want you know, in the world, a more equal world, basically. The Third World Network Africa is a pan-African research and advocacy organization which works for economic and social equity within Africa and for an equitable place for Africa in the global order. And what's interesting about Third World Network Africa is, is its time when, when it was established. This was a time of the great world conferences. Um, this, the Earth Summit, which was held in Brazil, had just ended. Um, we're going to have the ICPD, which is the International Conference on Population and Development. There was going to be a social summit, and then there was going to be Beijing. And in, the, in this process, a lot of civil society groups came together to campaign very actively for very good commitments from government and the international community towards development processes. And it was the rise of new social movements, the environmental movement, the women's movement, the human rights movement, and so on. So um, those of us who set up Third World Network had been engaged in one way or another with some of these processes. And in the process saw how very critical um, participation in the global civil society process was. All of us had been variously involved in the politics of the PNDC government after Jerry Rawlings and co came back to power at the end of 1981. Uh, when the, we felt that the regime had betrayed its original promise, we all pulled back. But we remained interested in the basis, this whole business about social justice, the creation of a new society, equal opportunities, and basically restructuring you know, politics and economy in Ghana. So we were looking for ways in which we could continue to work around those questions. So in 1993, one of our group, Charles Abugre, who had been involved with the Global Third World Network, uh, came up with the idea that it would be a good basis for us to try and create something together. So that's how we started Third World Network Africa. Dr. Yao Graham is the coordinator of Third World Network Africa. He was born as Jelukopo in the Keta district, Water region, in 1955. His mother was a teacher and father a public servant. He had his elementary education at Pando, where his mother was transferred to, and a secondary and sixth form education at St. Augustine College in Cape Coast between 1967 and 1974. Dr. Yao Graham pursued his tertiary education at the University of Ghana, Legon, had his master's degree at the University of Brussels, Belgium, and his PhD in law with specialization in international trade and investment issues at Warwick University in Britain. The student movement in the 70s and late 70s was an important formative period, certainly for me and I think for many of our generation who were involved in it. Because in that time we had a military government which had become the object of a lot of mass mobilization of a very broad spectrum, from students to workers to professionals to churches, anybody you name. And so in that period, it was, it was a, a period of formation. I mean, one of the main things I did, which I think it's, was relevant for my future life really, was I was involved you know, in editing work on student publications on campus. And uh, later on, of course, I developed, a, shall I say, a secondary career uh, in journalism, which started in that period. But politically, I think most of my ideals were cemented uh, in that period in the student movement. When I started, um lecturing at the university. Um, he, he, he had gone off to do his um, PhD after his uh, law studies. And then he actually interrupted 
his, his uh, PhD studies to come back to Ghana. In 1982, when uh, the PNDC came to power, I took a decision to come back to Ghana in, uh, in, in, in March 82. I, I kind of suspended my PhD studies in, in the UK and came back and got involved, you know, working in mass mobilization for, for in support of the PNDC. I was one of the people in charge of the national structures of the People's and Workers' Defense Committees. And one of the key sites that I worked was, was in Tema. And of course, it was in working in Tema, which is the most important industrial city in Ghana, that I became very heavily involved uh, in, the, in, the, in the workers' movement. But a key part of the work we did also was through a political organization that a number of us were involved in called the New Democratic Movement. We had a movement, the New Democratic Movement, and it was part of it. So we were very active in the circles of workers and students. Between 84 and 87, I was a lot more heavily involved you know, with the workers' movement in a kind of critical position against the PNDC. And one result of this, was, of course, was that in 1987, nine of us who were considered kind of political opponents of the, of the PNDC were arrested you know, and put in detention. I was in detention for, for a six-month period, but some of my colleagues were in detention for, for, for two years. Although many African countries are politically independent, they are economically tied to the apron strings of the developed world or their colonial masters, a situation Dr. Kwame Nkrumah dubbed neocolonialism. Africa, a net exporter of primary products due to lack of technology, is constantly exploited through unfair trade policies and unfavorable agreements between individual African countries and multinational companies. The Third World Network Africa, a non-governmental organization, NGO, is leaving no stone unturned to reverse these unfortunate trends. The idea of the Third World Network for those of us who started it was really to create a, an avenue within the liberalized politics of the Fourth Republic and also within the liberalized political context you know, of the 1990s Africa to continue to work around some of the issues that we've been concerned about. For all of us in the so-called Global South, we, we, we have been labeled the third world, okay, uh, which is r roughly the, the group of um, developing countries, who, most of whom were in the group of 77 and in the non-aligned movement, etc. And I think that there has been a, a genuine concern over the years about our relations with the so-called first and second world, especially the a very subordinate position where we are largely the importers and consumers of goods that are produced elsewhere. There are different ways in which Third World Network has intervened in, in national processes and, and it's done so in three broad areas, in gender issues, in, um, in, in environmental issues, particularly in mining, and then also in economic policy issues. Around the issues that we identify through our own analysis, through consultation with like-minded people and organizations across Africa, we develop issue-based networks. Because Third World Network Africa's work method is Pan-African. We are based in Ghana, but we are interested in the broad African development uh, uh, challenge. So we work with like-minded people in those countries. So through these issue-based networks, for example, around trade, we created an issue-based network called the Africa Trade Network since 1998. We bring together people working on trade and development issues across Africa. It is those organizations in those other African countries who are the primary vehicles for the collective work that we as African citizens work on. So Third World Network itself it does not have a direct presence. It has, a, it has political associations in these African countries. So around trade, there's the Africa Trade Network. Around mining, there's the, Afri there's the African Initiative on Mining, Environment and, and Society. So these are the vehicles. The, the work of Third World Network has evolved uh, over, over time. Uh, it has evolved in keeping also with uh, the specific uh, issues that we felt were, were the most uh, pressing. When we started, structural adjustment was by far the dominant issue on the continent. So for the first 
few years, we focused a lot on working against the impact of structural adjustment and working to, for Africans to regain control over policy making. We felt that independence had really become nominal given the influence that the World Bank and the IMF exerted on policy making on the continent. In addition, we know that the policies that they were imposing were not beneficial you know, for the majority. So we worked for quite a while around uh, the, the, the impact of, of structural adjustment. But from about 97 onwards, uh, international trade became very important because the, the, the framework of globalization and liberalization, which the World Bank was driving through nationally imposed policies, increasingly really were taken onto a kind of treaty basis with the creation of the World Trade Organization. So we felt that to be able to continue working on those same issues that affect Africa's space and Africa's development, we needed to pay attention to the impact of the World Trade Organization and global, global trade liberalization. So since about 96, 97, uh, trade issues have been a key part of our work. From the very beginning also, we've all also uh, recognized the importance of gender inequity and gender inequality. From the beginning, there was unanimity about the importance of that. It was not that I had to convince my colleagues that this was an important issue. Um, they, they were completely supportive and instead what we, we, were, we discussed was how to, how to involve these issues more deeply and we agreed on a two-pronged strategy. One had to do with um, ensuring that everything they were doing, the, the, all the other areas of TWN's work, trade, extractive industries and so on, would take a gender dimension very seriously. And the way it would do it would be one, to involve women activists in their work and two, to also ensure that in the analysis of the issues, the differential impacts of projects, programs and policies would be highlighted. And the second way we were going to do it was to ensure that we were in tune with the larger women's movement, feminist movement in Africa and in, in Ghana, and to tap into what they were doing and, and to begin to contribute to it. One of the early areas of engagement of Third World Network on gender was the whole gender and economic reforms in Africa. Ghana, like so many other African countries, carried out structural adjustment programs. And um, there has been a lot of analysis of these structural adjustment programs. And it is clear that in their design, nobody thought about the gendered impacts, you know, what particular issues would arise from them. We know, for instance, that so many workers lost their jobs, you know, because of the policies that were uh, uh, implemented. But it also became clear that there was, if you like, like a hidden text. People assumed that especially women would be available to subsidize their households, etc. And TWN's work in those years, it was not just in Ghana, it was across Africa, as it says, Third World Network Africa, showed the impact of um, particularly um, negative impacts of structural adjustment programs on women and, and a certain uh, unstated belief that somehow women and women's labor would be there to take care of all the cuts that were occurring in the state. From about 2000 onwards, we have worked on issues of mining and development. If you look across Africa, both now and historically, the exploitation of minerals and their, exp uh, their exportation in raw form has been very important for the economies of African countries. And one of the successes, if we can call it such, is that of the structural adjustment period was that the liberalization of mining regimes led to the influx of foreign investment into the mining sector and a new mining boom. And in the past 10 years, mineral prices have been very high and this has led to what we might call a new scramble uh, for, for, for Africa. And we've been working a lot on both the fact that the, the, the agreements between African countries and mining companies are not very beneficial for the countries. And secondly, also the impacts of, of these uh, of, of mining activities on communities. So mining has been uh, very, very, very important. Regional integration, of course, we've always worked on as something which is important because African countries are very small as individual units. And if they are going to be able to pull their weight together, 
within the global economy. We need to come together. I mean, this is one constant which cuts across all our work, which also explains why our engagement uh, is, is, is pan-African. In recent times, we have begun to pay some attention to climate justice questions uh, because Africa is a continent which is going to suffer the worst effects of climate change. And it's, climate change is not an environmental issue, it's a development issue. And since we are concerned about equitable development, we are beginning to pay some attention to that area uh, also. How is Third World Network Africa acknowledged in Africa? African governments react in different ways, depending on the issue, and also depending on the forum within which the issue is being discussed. Let's take trade. At the global level, developing countries are under a lot of pressure from the World Trade Organization. In that space, you find that there's more collaboration between African governments and campaigning African organizations. If you come home to African countries where people are agitating around bad mining policies, you find that the relations with the governments are a bit more conflictual because the criticism is in their face. So the reaction of governments depends on the issue, depends on the forum, and depends on the moment. So it, it kind of fluctuates from cooperation to hostility, you know, to resentment, to being open in giving access or being resistant to allowing access. So it, it really varies around the issue and also the, 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 the sites that you are working. But for us, the constant is that once we are convinced that what we are raising is right, at least we want to have some response to what we are raising. You know, uh, we don't say we are always right, but we believe that governments ought to open up to hear what citizens have to say. Because we know, for example, since the 1980s, the IMF and the World Bank and donors and God knows what else, means that that opportunity to be independent, or, you know, have that economic autonomy has not been there. So one of the things that third, organizations like Third World Network does is to be able to develop that capacity, to be able to have that critical distance from some of those dominant institutions and to be able to galvanize popular opinion and popular interests and harmonize them within some common networks. So for example, Third World Network is very active in uh, mining communities around Ghana. It's also active in the whole extractive sector and mining across Africa and has a network, it, it coordinates a network which is the African Initiative on Mining, Environment and Society. It does something similar in the area of trade, in the area of finance and so on and so forth. So in the context of this necessity of African institutions, African thinkers, African popular opinion, African you know, acti actors to be able to you know, gain an understanding of their own conditions and develop ways forward. I think that institutions like Third World Network Africa are playing an important, important role. Uh, they have a publication, a monthly magazine, and uh, they attend a number of meetings, conferences, and, and other such gatherings on the continent, and also they have participated in a number of the global economic fora. So I think that their work is not only felt in Ghana, I think that their work is felt in many parts of Africa through engagements with, say, the African Union, engagements with UN agencies, and also direct engagement with governments in some parts of Africa. In terms of the key institutions and the key arena of uh, in, uh, trade policy formation, like the WTO and so on and so forth, and at the level of the African Union, at the level of the Economic Commission for Africa, at the level of uh, international development institutions like UNCTAD and the UN system, I think that uh, organizations like Third World Network have been prominent in you know, developing a counter-narrative, a counter-understanding a counter -understanding to what was this orthodoxy. And in fact, if you take uh, the last UNCTAD summit, which was this year, earlier this year, the UNCTAD Secretary General, who, uh, who used to be the boss of the WTO, and therefore one of the champions of free trade liberalization, is the one who is saying that that kind of free trade and free finance-led liberalization is not conducive to development of, for developing countries, and in fact is not con conducive for the stability of the global economy as a whole. So there is, if you like, the beginnings of a sea change. And I think that I would like to think that organizations like Third World Network at home, across Africa, and on the international stage have played their role in bringing about this re rethink in maintaining a critical voice when it was well nigh impossible or to do so, and uh, in gradually opening the space where alternatives are becoming increasingly possible. 
what TWN has been able to do has been to forge um, partnerships with like-minded organizations in Asia, in uh, South America, and other places. Because this is part of the so-called global third world. You know, what have they done? What have they been able to do? And uh, again, in, in that regard, the area of social protection, if you look at uh, Latin America today, Latin America today, you know, in the 60s, they were going through the same coup d'etats and dictatorships that we were going through. But now, many of those countries have been able to raise themselves up. How did they do it? What can we learn from them? Are we fated to go through the same kind of thing where if we don't get aid, you know, we're not able to do anything in our country. In 1999, the Third World Network Africa hosted a conference in Accra on mining and African development. Many activists from Africa and the Global North attended that conference. One of the aims of the conference was to share experiences and to involve people from the Global North in finding solutions to the continent's mining problems. As a sequel, the African Initiative on Mining, Environment and Society, AIMS, was formed. What is AIMS supposed to achieve? The conference brought together activists from the Global North, particularly Canada, who is an important source of mining investment uh, in Africa, uh, academics and also activists from across the African continent. Now, the conference was an example of uh, Thelwell Network Africa's interest in a pan-African approach to, to African development problems. Because mining is a very important sector in many African countries. But we found very early on that despite this common feature, in almost all African countries, most of the advocacy work was reactive, focusing on the community level impacts around human rights and environmental impacts. But there was very little sharing of experience and coordination. The same companies were involved across the continent, and yet people were reacting in atomized ways around the continent. So we organized this meeting to begin to share experiences. And also we involved people from the global north because the firms came from those countries. And there were activists in those countries, researchers working on the problem from their side. So it seemed to make sense that all these would get together to discuss how we could work together around the problem. But since that 99 period, in keeping with the normal practice in relation to the networks that Thelwell Network Africa hosts, every year we have at least one planning and review meeting. And this meeting is moved around the continent because the meeting being held in a, in, in a country gives solidarity to those who are working on that issue in their country. People come from out all over. It shows to people in that country that those people working in that country are not alone. It allows a visibility for the issues in that country. And then the, reinforces the fact that the network is a collective kind of enterprise. Artisanal mining, or galamse, as it is called in the local parlance, has become a major problem in Ghana. This type of mining is not only dangerous to the miners, but also harmful to the environment, as the operatives use dangerous chemicals which trickle into water bodies and pollute them. What is the position of the Third World Network Africa on artisanal mining? Small-scale mining it's an Africa-wide issue. There are about 5 million you know, artisanal and small-scale miners across the continent. Now, in a way, we have to understand small-scale mining in the same way that we understand street trading. Because these are all people working in the informal economy, trying to find a way of life in economies which are not creating jobs. And in the mining areas, large-scale mining displaces people, so they have to find a way of, of earning an income. Secondly, the terms of trade have moved against the food producers because of trade liberalization. So they need to, to make a living. So all these young people are available for anybody who can pay for them to dig for them. In fact, the people who get the least benefits in the small scale mining are those who are actually doing the digging. Because there's a whole chain of financiers, equipment suppliers, buyers, and so on and so forth. 
But one result of this extensive activity of illegal small-scale miners called Galamse is that there's a lot of pollution. They endanger their health, okay? And, uh, and also they create hazards for others and they're also damaging uh, the land. Now, our view is that this is a development challenge which has to be solved first and foremost at a development challenge. An employment challenge before you even come to the issues about the criminal justice aspect. The chair of the National Development Planning Commission, Mr. P.V. Obeng, speaking at a mining forum recently, made a very interesting point. He said, you know, more than 20 years ago, before the economic reforms in Ghana, there were people walking around with bags under the armpits in street corners, changing dollars, you know, and they were illegal. But a way was found to bring them into the legal system. Now they've all opened forex bureaus. So how does policy create opportunities for small scale miners to become mainstream? This is, this is, this is the argument we make. But at the same time, there are issues of foreigners who are not supposed to work in small-scale mining. There's a Chinese invasion in small-scale mining. And they are lawless. Questions arise about how they got into the country, what visas they are on, and so on. Now, that clearly needs to be addressed. So in not simply offering a critique of that and being consistent about that, but being part of a process of doing something more proactive and positive in putting forward, constructing and putting forward a positive agenda such as is entailed in the African mining vision, I think it's an immense, immense success. I think that they have pushed a lot to get governments to be hesitant in signing the uh, Europe uh, uh, Economic Partnership Agreement. I think partly or largely due to the work of the Third World Network, governments have hesitated very much in getting into signing these agreements. Recently, I have heard on the media the government of Ghana uh, wanting to sign this agreement. I do hope that they are signing it because there have been some changes in the agreement as the Europeans presented, us, presented them to us. I do not know the content of the agreement our government wants to sign, but if it is the original agreement and the government has not uh, heeded the call of the Third World Network, then I would say that the government is making uh, a step that may not be very, very good for the government and the people of Ghana. The open-door conditionality imposed on developing countries by the Bretton Woods Institution tilts the scale in favor of developed countries. The truth is, many developing countries export only raw materials, which are far cheaper than the finished products they import. What has the Third World Network Africa been doing to influence trade policies in Africa? Liberalization framework that was initiated by structural adjustments as globally determined by nationally based policies in the sense that, I mean, there's a global paradigm uh, framed and controlled by the Bretton Woods institutions across Africa in the 80s, 90s all our countries got into these agreements, which led to national policies that liberalized uh, economies. At the same time, a number of global processes were taking place, primarily those centered around the, 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 the treaties of the, of the World Trade Organization and a number of uh, bilateral uh, investment regimes. The logic of globalization, its effect on Africa, has primarily been negative. For example, the economic partnership agreements with the European Union uh, are consistent with the developmental needs uh, of, of the continent. Of course, this issue of the developmental needs, it's a contested notion. Because if you look at the orientation of the African elite, as well as governments, many of them take the view that the more we liberalize and allow in foreign, foreign capital, the better the development for the countries. And of course, if you are located where you'll be one of the joint venture partners of the foreign companies, or you will be distributing the imported goods 
or you are representing one of the firms, it's beneficial. But if you look at the way inequality has grown in Africa over the past 20 years as a result of these policies, clearly from the standpoint of the majority, the policies are not beneficial. The fact that it hasn't happened yet as conclusively as they would like, and which is what I'm describing as, a, as an, a continuing opportunity, is down to the efforts of organizations like Third World Network Africa and the kind of economic justice network uh, formation, the alliances that they have built around this, this, these issues, the public awareness that they have uh, engendered, the outreach that they've undertaken, the consensus they have, they have built between different stakeholders and so on and so forth. When you really look at African countries, despite all our so-called differences, you find very broad patterns that are similar, particularly in terms of how um, uh, our major trading and uh, industrial partners deal with us. They don't see Ghana, they don't see Togo, they just see, uh, what is it, ACP, Africa, Caribbean, Pacific nation. They lump us all of us together. And it is important that in our own analysis, we, even as we know that there are differences among us, that we are able to look at the broad patterns and see how sometimes we can be implementing one policy in Ghana, but unless we are coordinating very closely with La Côte d'Ivoire or Togo, it can be completely undercut, you know, and, and not have any kinds of impacts. And I think that what Third World Network has been able to do, TWN over the years, has been this broad African canvas. But even more important, also looking at the experiences of other countries and regions, such as Malaysia, etc., for us to learn from them. If you look at the way uh, African countries are relatively small geographically and also economically, it's very clear that in terms of the continent's development, regional integration is a necessity. These agreements have tended to intensify the fragmentation of the continent. So one of the things that also is very much part of our work on trade is also that we recognize that regional integration is a necessity. African development. So we look at how all these agreements have a potential to impede or undermine uh, African uh, integration. Another area which is relevant is that if you look at the investment treaties which are being signed by African countries, they give very swinging, sweeping space for foreign investors. One of the sad aspects actually of economic policy over the past 20 years has been the ways in which the development of local enterprises has not been at the center of policy making. So one of the things we've been concerned about is how local companies, particularly productive companies, are strengthened by trade and investment policy. So in Ghana, for example, for almost 10 years, we've been working with the Ghana Poultry Farmers Association as an example of how trade and investment policy have undermined the capacity of local enterprises to develop, even where they are potentially competitive with foreign firms and with foreign imports. Because we want policy to move away from an instinctive prioritization of the interests of foreign firms to a policy which starts with asking, what does trade and investment policy do to promote the development of local enterprises. Soon after the launch of NEPAD in 2001, the Third World Network Africa organized an international conference in Accra in 2002. The conference took a critical look at the NEPAD document and the negative impact it would have on the continent. As a follow-up, a book entitled Africa and Development Challenges in the New Millennium, edited by Dr. Yao Graham, Jay Adesina and A. Olukoshi, was published. What are the issues raised in the book? That book came out of a conference we organized in 2002 in response to the launch of NEPAD. Most of the papers in that book were very critical of NEPAD and we raised the question about the neoliberal economics, neoliberal economic policies and their negative effects for the continent. Now the global economic crisis from 2008 vindicated the basic argument that we made in that conference and which I reflected in the collection of papers in that, that book. 
the policies have been adopted, particularly by the major powers, where the state has become a more active actor in economies, also vindicates some of the points that we made that the state had been forced too far back. Uh, a key new development, which the book did not deal with at that time uh, in any great detail, has to do with the rise of the, the, the basic countries, Brazil, South Africa, China, India, and so on. Well, that was not the focus of the book. But I think an import, by and large, the, the, the arguments and the, and the demands in, in that book remain valid. An important new element, as I said, is that post the global crisis, when the power of the traditional North Atlantic powers has weakened, you know, even more than, than at that time, and these new uh, powers like China have become much more active in Africa. The, the challenge of how African countries seize the opportunities represented by the rise of these powers, whilst making sure that the predatory part of their interest in Africa is kept, it's an important challenge. Because a challenge which has become even more stark from an African perspective since the book was published is the important issue of climate change. I mean, African countries, more than any other continent, will be impacted by, common, uh, by climate change. And because the continent has the least resources to plan for adapting to climate change. So yes, the main issues raised in that uh, book uh, remain valid. There are new elements which have come to the fore. But the responses which we argue, particularly common African voices and action around a number of key areas remains a, 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 a continuing area of challenge. Uh, we have important formal African organizations like the AU, the regional economic bodies and so on. But frankly, they are not punching the weight that they have to punch for them to properly represent the interests of, 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 of African people. Too often our governments are ready to go off on the side you know, and take a little bribe in the form of aid and leave the larger picture, you know, unattended to.